Hello everyone and welcome to today's tree planting ceremony dedicated to the memory of activist Mark Ashton. Mark grew up in Port Rush, not far from here, and moved to London in the early 1980s. He was co-founder of LGSM and later General Secretary of the Young Communist League. Speakers today are Jude Copeland, who has campaigned tirelessly for the erection of a blue plaque dedicated to Mark, which was rejected by the Ulster History Circle. Joining Jude are activists Michael Kerrigan, playwright and author of Pits and Perverts, Bernadette McCallisky, who inspired a whole generation of young people like Mark, and finally, Mark's co-founder of LGSM, Mike Jackson. We at Inter Independent Pride Dairy believe this to be a fitting tribute to an extraordinary young man. We'd very much like to thank St. Collins Park House for facilitating this event, to all you for attending, and to Unison Community Branch for sponsoring this event as well. And also, guys, we have T-shirts over here for sale, fifteen pound or ten pound concession. So, if we could ask Michal to come and say a few words. What a lovely thing to do! I have never ever been to a, a tree planting ceremony before. It's very nice. It's very uh, spiritual. I want oak, by the way, <laughs> in Brook Park. Maybe not here. <laughs> uh, thank you all for coming. Um, my contribution would be I was there during the minor strike in London and, and I helped collect and do things. And um, what I want to say about Mark Ashton's contribution, he was a very brave man, very strong. I never ever met him. I always saw him from a distance. He was always standing up with his finger pointing in the air. He really terrified the life out of me, so I went nowhere near him at all. <laughs> I really never met him, no, and, um, but what the contribution, what happened was after that uh, lesbian and gay support the minors uh, strike, there was, an, you know, gay rights were always in the back burner with the Labour Party and the trade unions, and what happened after that, they went from the back burner to the forefront, and after that, all the trade unions, like the Unite Union and the Unison, they all had big them, big branches, lesbian and gay branches, and the British Labour Party took uh, stuff on board, and um, so therefore it led to all the progressive legislation that happened, you know, and then eventually come into the, um, you know, the, 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 the marriage equality stuff, which was the Tories, not the Labour Party who did that. And, um, but, and it actually it took the British Labour Party three terms to get rid of Thatcher's Clause 28, and that's a bit of negative there uh, uh, thing, but it, you know, things do take time. But um, so there, you I think that's the great contribution that Mark and uh, Mike made. That it was very, very important because suddenly the unions and the Labour Party took notice and stood up and took notice. This was a very, very, very serious issue: gay and lesbian equality and queer rights. So this is terrific, and it's very emotional. And it's a very powerful thing to do. And um, congratulations, and it's great to see Mike over here uh, in Derry. He loves coming here. So, Mike, welcome, and thank you very much for all that. Jude, I'm not going to speak very much, by the way. I'm just going to say people's names. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for coming along today. Um, I feel like a huge uh, fraud coming here to this great city of rights and of activism and of kindness and actually trying to tell you about LGBT rights and about individual freedoms and realizing rights. I didn't know Mark Ashton um, and I watched the film for the first time in the presence of Mike Jackson in a really little rundown, I think, East End pub where Mike and Dave, one of the other LGSMers, were raising money for um, a number of their causes. And the reason why I started this campaign was it, it kind of took me two years to get there. 
But Mike was really, really friendly. I chatted to him at the end. And Dave said to me, whenever he heard my, ac my accent, he said, do you know what? It's really lovely hearing that accent again. And he started to get a little bit emotional. And he was thinking about Mark Ashton. So I'm also a bit of a historian, amateur historian. And the thing that's really important for me, for Mark Ashton, is that the anniversary of his death, he was from Portrush, he was from here. He fled the criminalization of homosexuality, uh, the British criminalization of homosexuality in Ireland. He fled that to go to London. And in London, he went there and he helped people. That was his first instinct. And he did that through the London Gay Switchboard by taking the early calls about people scared of their sexuality, of living away from home, of being rejected by parents, of being rejected by family, of being vilified in the media, and of this new disease that was coming over from America, which was AIDS. So the backdrop of all of that kindness and all of that remembrance and all of that love, what really drove me to start this campaign was that people didn't really understand that Mark Ashton was from here. And his date of death, which I don't think anybody really realized in Northern Ireland, was also the date of the first same-sex marriage. So the first same-sex marriage, a lovely lesbian couple got married just outside Belfast, and it was on the date of Mark's death. And I thought to myself, I wonder what Mark would have thought of all of that. And I wonder what he would have, would he have been happy about how far we've come? Would he be happy about the marches and the activism and the emails that we've had to send, the agitation that we've had to do? I think he would be really quite angry that we had to go through all of that, but we got there in the end. And the reason why I think Mark Ashton is such a role model for people today is that he thought about other vilified minorities. People who are minoritized, they're not minorities, they're minoritized by a system which does not recognize their dignity and their rights. They might have legal protections, but they do not have the enjoyment and they do not have the dignity to enjoy those rights. And I think that is the next step. So whenever I think about Mark Ashton, I was thinking about Foyle Pride yesterday, standing in the Guild Hall, which is an incredible, I'm not familiar with Derry very well, but it was just incredible. All of these people coming through and passionate, passionate people who are aware of their history. And I was between these Bible protesters on one side, there was, they had acoustics that were blaring out. They were protected by the police and they had the most horrible signage. And on the other side, well, I was beside Mike Ashton and we were holding up the LDSM banner to try and block out this hatred. But on the stage, we had a straight married couple. And I just thought, what on earth do these people understand about pride? We have had to march, we have had to email, we have had to fight for marriage equality, and it seems to have been lost. So I'm so honored to be asked by Indepre Independent Pride Derry to come here. It's just such an honor. And I think that Mark, if he was here today, he would be thinking about who our equivalent of the miners are. So he would be thinking about who are the low paid workers, who are the, the nurses on 1%, who are the barristers who have to represent the victims of domestic abuse who are earning less than minimum wage, if they can actually get a barrister? Who, who are the people who are helping the sick? Who are our caring people? Who are our asylum seekers who are on eight pounds 10 a week? All of those minority people, people who have to tra travel to England to get abortion care, people who have to fund their own trans health care, I think Mark would be horrified. He would be heartened by the next generation and also by the role models that we have in front of us here today. He would take such 
pride in that. I think, I don't know him, I'm just guessing from all of his friends what they've told me. But I think one of the biggest things, and I'm going to finish now because I could just go on forever and bore you to sleep, but I think one of the things that I learned from the repeal movement was that it's a bit like cleaning a house. You just take one room at a time. So if you can help one person who needs abortion care, if you can help one trans go fund me to fund their transition, if you can support one little beep of a horn whenever you're going past a picket, which you should always not cross, obviously, and just do that one thing. And together, if we are all doing that, if there is that solidarity in what we are doing, we will change things and we will replicate the actions of Mark Ashton and we will honour his memory. So thank you very much. Jude, thanks so much. That's amazing. And we love having you in Derry. Um, Bernadette, can I ask you to come up and speak, please? I'm just walking carefully because I'm the only person small enough to fall down the hole. <laughs> uh, I swear we didn't, you know, we didn't plan this. We weren't talking before. But uh, first of all, I'd like to, to thank Independent Pride for the invitation. It's, it's a particular joy and, and privilege to be here. Uh, firstly, to maintain the independence and the protest movement that Pride is, and, and to resist the being drawn into the culture and enjoyment of better days that we know don't actually exist, and, and the pretense that we haven't fought the battles we have fought, and that the battles that still have to be fought don't matter. But what I, what I wanted just and, and to say very briefly today, uh, because I think, uh, like everybody else, uh, I'm, I'm waiting to hear from, from, from Mike. I think it's an important day for all of us, uh, first of all, to remember uh, a, young, a young man who was one of us. He was one of us. He was from here. He was part of our place and our community. And like the rest of us, he suffered all the contradictions uh, and all the problems that that created. I suppose when I think of, of, of Portrush, uh, to me it's a place I went as a child. Uh, and very few people from the Catholic community made their way from rural Tyrone to Portrush. They kind of took the train the other direction to Bundoran. Uh, and I only mention it in, in terms of a fundamental act of kindness. Uh, we, like everybody we knew in Cookstown, uh, were poor. That is to say, in the modern parlance, we had lived experience of poverty. But we called it poor then, and uh, it's good enough for me now. We were poor, but almost everybody we knew were poor. There were people in Cookstown who weren't. We just didn't know them. They weren't friends of ours. And like many other people, uh, we, didn't, we didn't have the price of holidays, but there was something very privileged about us that we didn't even know about. We went to Port Rush every week, or sorry, every year for a week, because my mother had a friend who owned a caravan. So we orange man from Coleraine. He meant, remained an orange man all his life. Uh, but those things didn't matter. There was a human solidarity and, and a human kindness uh, of, from people of their own teenage and young adult years who then maintain solidarity and friendship and kindness uh, when, their, when their lives all go different ways. So it's a very, it's a very, simple, uh, a very simple thing that connects me to him. But the important thing is the act of kindness that is solidarity, as well as political solidarity, as well as the rhetoric and the education and the analysis of solidarity of how we're all in the one fight. And that's crucial and that's very important. 
It's not enough. Each one of us has to try and pull somebody out of the hole we are all in, in as much as we can. No matter what battle we are fighting of our own, we have to make some small space, if it's all we can do, to stand with and support people fighting another battle who may be worse off than we are. So one of the most important things that, that the message of solidarity teaches us is rattling cans is important. Standing out on the street, trying to persuade people to make a donation for minors, when by standing there, the thing you're most likely to get is insulted, is probably one of the bravest things that, peop that people did. It can't have been easy. It cannot have been easy. As young members of, of the gay, the, the bisexual, the lesbian, the trans, the queer movement, to take your personal self into personal and physical danger of denigration, of insult, of assault, in order to try and persuade people at the very least that they should understand what was happening in families who didn't have enough to eat because of the minor strike. You know, that's, that's a bit that cannot be forgotten. And, and if we have the analysis, and if we have the ideology, and if we have the rhetoric that shows that we are all part of the one struggle, but we don't have that, we have nothing. And the reason I say that now, follow, following on from what has been said, is that we are going into the battle of our lives, and we better know that. Right now, all of us, straight, gay, lesbian, bisexual, trans, queer, working class, working class with pretensions of being middle class, <laughs> people who think they're above everybody else and smarter because they get salaries instead of wages and paid by the month instead of the week. Uh, all those pretenses are going to fall away over this winter. And don't be in any doubt about that. People in this city, regardless of their sexuality and regardless of whether they're working or on benefits, there will be people of this, in this city die over this winter of cold, of isolation, of hunger, or of despair. And that will be replicated across the United Kingdom. There are days it makes me so angry, I can't concentrate. There are times it makes me so overwhelmingly sad, I can't concentrate. And then I catch myself on and say, burned it, sitting here spitting bad temper, or crying isn't going to cut it. Or as one of my daughters said one time, when the other of my daughters disappeared in the company of the PSNI, she said, yoga ain't going to cut it this time, Mum. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a standard, uh, it's a standard by, wor by word in our house, for here comes trouble. But yoga ain't going to cut it this time when we go into the winter. We need all the solidarity we have. We need it in our thought, in our word, and in our action. And I think that that is the message that, that Mark left us. To have been in the position that he was in and to have prioritized the hardship of the miners was one of the most intellectual, one of the most human, and one of the bravest thing for any young Northern Ireland person stuck in London 
with the Northern Ireland accent to start with uh, at that time. So it's a privilege, I think, for us and important for us to remember him in this way. I'd also say it's important for us to remember him in this way. Because planting a tree is going to be part of saving all of us. And I'm reminded of an Alice Walker poem uh, about planting trees. And you should go and look it up. It's, it's, it's a very powerful poem. But there's a whole series of things that she says in the poem that when they happen to us, we should plant a tree. And then being mindful that when the trees, when they say they cut the tree down, plant another, until we've grown a whole forest. But be under no illusion that when we have a forest, the bastards will try and cut it down. <laughs> so we need to be ready, not only to keep planting trees, but to defend the forest. Thank you. Thank you, Bernadette, and thanks so much for taking the time to come here today. Um, so it's amazing to have Mike Jackson back in Derry with us, and it's just an honour to have you here speaking today. So, Mike. Bernadette's a hard act to follow, eh? <laughs> <laughs> um, we have memorials to Mark in Paris. This little part's been dedicated in his name in the Marais district of Paris. There's a mural in Ripollet it, near Barcelona in Spain with LGSM and Mark in that mural, huge mural. It's a six foot high and it's about 50 yards long. There's a black in London that we put up, Lesbians and Gay Sport the Miners, in Mark's memory above Gay's Word Bookshop. And in Belfast, there's St Mark Ashton Room in Unite's building. And now a tree in Derry City, dedicated in Mark's name. But Port Rush is our goal. That's where he grew up, and that was the influence on his life. So we're, we're, we're either side of Port Rush now. We've got Derry on one side, we've got Belfast on the other, and we're coming for you, Port Rush. And we will get that fact. We will get it. And thanks to Jude for all you're doing towards towards that goal and thanks uh, Char and Jim and, and Bernadette and everybody else for inviting me over to your beautiful city again. So Mike died as, 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 as Jude said on February 11th 1987. I'm just thinking about what was happening then. Clause 28 uh, was drafted and the fight back was uh, beginning to fight it and it became legislation later as section 28. George Michael and Aretha Franklin were at number one in the charts with I Knew You Were Waiting For Me. <laughs> LGBT people had no legal rights whatsoever. But at the same time, the trade union movement was working with progressive Labour councils, Cam uh, Camden, Islington, Liverpool, Manchester, to further our employment rights and equal opportunities for gay people. British Airways had been privatised. Liberace declared that he was not gay. <laughs> and Ray and Reggie and Stephanie were all depicted in the movie uh, Pride and myself danced at heaven ecstatically. Lots of times. <laughs> if Mark was alive today, he'd be speaking to you now, not me. He loved the limelight. I hated it. And I'd get out of it whenever I could, but unfortunately... That's not the case. You'd be amazed that the LGBT movement has come as, as far as it, as it has today, as I am still. I just think it's incredible. He wouldn't be surprised that Pride in London has become grotesquely commercially uh, marketised affair. He'd be joyous to know that Nelson Mandela had been released from 27 years in prison and went on to become president of South Africa and that apartheid had finally been beaten. He'd be very proud that the yes vote to marriage equality in the Republic had won two to one. He wouldn't be surprised that the Tory government today have descended into a corrupt regime propped up by liars and that their current leader has happily declared 
she'd be well prepared to push a button for total nuclear annihilation. He'd be gobsmacked that his short life had been in, immortalised in a movie called Pride, as I still am <laughs> to this day. He wouldn't be surprised that Bernadette was on our side today, still fighting for our freedoms as consistently as she was when they met in 1985. He'd been amazed to see Derry City celebrating Pride yesterday, and he'd be very proud of the youngsters yesterday shouting, we're here, we're queer, and we have no fear. But sadly, he isn't here. Instead, here we are taking up the baton that he's left for us. And I'm proud of the facts, and we're proud, and Mark Ashton would have been enormously proud of those youngsters yesterday. Keep on fighting, no matter what the odds are. The prize is a world free from hate, where everyone lives with dignity, freedom, love, and a mutual respect, regardless of sexuality, gender, race, etc. Solidarity is, and always will be, everything. Keep up the fight. Take care. And the, I've been a gardener all my life. I've dug many holes for tree planting ceremonies, but I've never acted like the Queen and actually planting one. <laughs> Mike, Mike tell, tell them about what happened whenever you went under the hole. Uh, what, the miners' welfare? Yes. Hole? Oh, okay. Or else right. I'm not buying another pint on Sandino's. <laughs> All right. I don't know where that's come from, but it will. So the movie Pride has a lot of fictional elements in it, which we have no problem with. We, we trusted Stephen Burris, the scriptwriter. But one bit that departs from uh, the reality of what happens uh, was it, it, it kind of portrays the fact that that very first visit that we made to the South Wales mining community, that when we walk, walked into the miners' welfare hall, there was some hostility. That actually wasn't the case, and it wasn't eight of us who went down, it was 27 of us who went down. All kind of charity shop chic youngsters living in London, uh, except for me, I was always a terrible dresser. Mark was quite smart. And when we walked into that miners' welfare hall, the, obviously the mining families were on, uh, on strike, so they had no money, so they couldn't pay for babysitters. So there were every generation in that miners' welfare hall, kids running around, some kids asleep on blankets underneath the, the, the tables and so forth. And when we walked in, it was packed. And there we were, conspicuous, as I said. And when we walked in, the whole tenors of the conversations dropped, and we knew that was a reaction to us being there. And for a split second, it was a, <gasps> what's this about moment? And then somebody stood up and clapped and applauded us, and that whole community of two to three hundred mining families clapped and applauded our presence. They'd worked out where we were coming from, and they wanted to know all about us because the media and the government were telling lies about them and they'd worked out that they'd always been told lies about queer people and that we didn't eat babies for breakfast, we didn't have two heads and it was the most fantastic thing and that standing ovation was one of those moments that you just know you're actually living through history that is changing the world now. And that's, we came back to London that weekend so fired up, nothing would stop us. Absolutely nothing would stop us. And the, of course, the momentum gained and gained and gained. And we used to love collecting outside the gay pubs and right-wing gays would say, what are you collecting for the miners for? And then other customers would leave, look at them, reach in the pocket, chuck a tenner in the bucket and look at the, the, the right wingers and say, my dad's a miner, my uncle's a miner, my brother's a miner, my grandfather was a miner. Because actually the truth is, there isn't the LGBT community there and the mining community over there. We're one and the same. That's it. And it's a class struggle. And that's what Mark believed in. And that's what we all believe in as well. Solidarity. <laughs> So Emer is going to play a song. This was written um, by Jimmy Somerville for Mark. For a friend, isn't it, Michael? Yep. For a friend, yeah. So Emer will put this on, and Mike is going to plant our beautiful tree. Oh, I'm and you're going to do the unveiling of her. <laughs> 